Peter Reich is a Regents Professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Forest Ecology. Um, a Regents Professor is a, a rare animal. There are only about 20 of them, and there are people who are outstanding teachers and also who have made an outstanding contribution to society. It's sort of like being a Jedi Knight of the academic <laughs> world. And Peter's had all of the other uh, uh, awards that the university could give. I know of his teaching excellence because I've been privileged to audit his course on climate change at the graduate school level, but uh, I didn't know that he was a superstar in research until he received a prestigious international award from the, from the future, what's the name? Futures Resources of America, not America, it's a Spanish, it's a Spanish foundation. Um, foundation that gives uh, a lot of money and art and a lot of honor um, in this field. There is no Nobel Prize in this field, so this is sort of the, the uh, forestry equivalent of that. So uh, Peter, Peter looks at, we look at plants from the outside, Peter looks at plants from the inside, how they metabolize, what their structure is, how they grow. So we're delighted to have you. Thank you very much, Chuck, and it's great to see all you folks uh, willing to come inside on this beautiful day to hear a little bit about what I'm going to say. And if I'm in your way, I'll try to step back here a lot. I'm going to talk about what I jokingly call earth, wind, fire, and climate change. Uh, the future for our northern forests is work done with a team of many other folks, uh, both recently and in the past. To drink? Just look at it brighter at all. Close the shades at all? Close some of the shades a little bit. Uh, but first, joking though, I'm calling it a public service announcement, and that is a, a new project I've been involved in called the Boreal Forest Resilience Project. Uh, intending to enhance resilience of economic, societal, and ecological aspects in an area of transformational change. This is a briefly resilience of the capacity to tolerate disturbance and change without loss of system structure and function. It's a term that applies to ecosystems but also financial systems, so social systems, um, and to recover from such shocks by adaptation. And this is a, a new project. Uh, in concert with the Forest Service, the counties, the states, and many other uh, groups. And the challenge is to build resilience, to enhance the sustainability of our coupled human natural system here in northern Minnesota in the face of dynamic change from climate change, but many other changes as well. And if all of you in this room are aware of boreal forests, represent one third of the world's forest ecosystems, and perform a variety of services critical to the well being of global society. Pictures of those here: watershed protection, tourism, uh, vital economic products, native habitat for plant and animal species, slowing climate change via carbon sequestration, and potential sources of economic development through minerals and ore deposits. And the challenge we always face is balancing the need for economic development with the need to protect the environment. And that challenge is only going to get ever greater in the future. Now, as all of you are also aware, the boreal forest in Minnesota, shown here. In the green, which is the original extent of the spruce fir zone uh, when Europeans got here, this part of Minnesota is considered to be particularly sensitive to climate change due to its location at the transition between the temperate and boreal biomes. Forests 400 miles north of here in central Canada are not likely to change from climate change very rapidly, but our forests are. So the challenges and opportunities facing northern Minnesota <coughs> Our forest industries face global competition. Emerging bioenergy industries promise jobs and cleaner energy, but demand more of our forests and our environment. <coughs> Climate change, including indirect effects such as storms, fires, and droughts, land use, and invasive species, all threaten the health and diversity and resilience of our forest ecosystems. We're also faced with increasing parcelization and development once this economic downturn uh, ends or slows down. Development's going to ramp back up. That's a huge problem. Um, and it's coupled with increased wildfire risk, all in an area where wildland wilderness area protection generates huge political debate. So how do we, how do we deal with all these issues in a way that brings people together rather than splitting people up and, and fighting about this? So this new project uh, is a collaborative collaboration intended to cut across all political boundaries. We want 
the most left-wing, right-wing, green, brown organizations to be part of this because otherwise we're not going to make progress. Now, I'm not a, totally naive. We don't expect to actually resolve all these problems, but instead to take the first steps of getting people to work together a bit more than they have in the past to try to deal with all this complex uh, problems. And the project goals are to partner with local, state, national, and international groups, academic, government, industry, and an environmental organization to better understand and adaptively manage border forests in Minnesota and elsewhere within the context of these complex interactions of humans and nature in the face of climate, economic, and social change. So I put this up here because some of you may be uh, willing or interested in participating in this because we're going to get stakeholders from all walks of life involved in this project in the next four or five years. So I'll come very back to that at the end about the new project. But now we're going to go back and talk about the climate context and some of the things we think are happening to Minnesota's boreal forests. Um, now there are many indicators of climate change. We all know that climate change, if it exists, is due to greenhouse gases and other uh, perturbations. I'm going to start with the notion that anyone in this room who uh, believes in gravity or, or is happy to get CAT scans or use a cell phone should also believe in climate change. It's either we should take everything from science or nothing from science. But we can debate about that for anyone who's a disbeliever in climate change. There are many indicators of climate change. Global average sea level rise, global average temperature rise, change in snow cover. Maybe the simplest way to put it is so far 2010 globally is the hottest uh, year on record. And most of the hottest years on record are in the last 10 or 20 years. And within this climate change context, we're going to focus right up here where we're sitting, northeast of Minnesota, the Boundary Water, Canoe Area Wilderness, and other parts of the Superior National Forest and the Quetico. And this is a picture of the Boundary Waters a couple of years ago, or part of it. We have to ask, what's the future going to hold for us? Nature is dynamic. Climate is dynamic. Nothing ever stays the same, even without human perturbation. Given climate change, though, what's our future? If it gets hotter and drier, will we end up with old woodland and savannas, such as existed at the prairie forest border when European settlers got here? Or if it's hotter and moister, will we end up with northern hardwood forests, like this sugar maple dominated forest in northern Wisconsin? A very different kind of landscape than this, neither of which look like our boreal forests, though. Or will the failure of today's forests with climate change and the uh, lack of capacity of, of savanna or forest vegetation further south to get here and establish, leave us with something like up in the upper right, some kind of shrubland dominated by invasive species uh, that has none of the characteristics we value economically or ecologically. But which of these are our future? We don't really know. And that's why researchers try to use a variety of tools, models, observational studies, experiments to get a better handle on what this might be. We could use divine inspiration to try to figure it out, but um, science at least gives us a path that, that hopefully will help us understand this a little bit. The four things I want to focus on in the next 50 minutes are a little bit of background about the natural history of this area to give us a context for ecological change. Remind us of the major disturbances of the last decade by wind and fire. Talk about climate change in the future spend most of my time hopefully here, and then briefly ask what can be done. We have to remember that Minnesota, for a flat place far from the ocean, is very, very variable. Uh, what's now agriculture was originally tall grass prairie in the southwest part of the state, transitioning through oak woodland and hardwood forest to the boreal forest in the northeast part of the state. Um, Median temperatures vary as much as 9 degrees Fahrenheit from the southwest to the northeast. That's a heck of a lot for a small distance in the middle of the continent. But that's one reason we have such a very, we're at this ecotone between the northern forest, eastern forest, and the western tall grass prairie. Change is, is inevitable. This shows glacial change without human interference. Uh, 14,000 years ago, that's where the Laurentian ice sheet was. It shrunk from 11,000 to 8,000 to 5,000 years ago, and it's still shrinking, and we're accelerating that shrinkage. Um, in a geological time frame, 10,000 years is, is nothing. And so this is a very, very dynamic part of the world. Things have changed uh, over time and will change in the future. This shows from pollen records 